today is the first Sunday of Advent. The tradition of lighting candles in a wreath goes back to Europe. The Advent wreath first appeared in Germany in 1839. A Lutheran minister working at a mission for children created a wreath out of the wheel of a cart. He placed 20 small red candles and four large white candles inside the ring. The red candles were lit on weekdays for the, and the four white candles were lit on Sunday. Eventually, the Advent wreath was created out of evergreens, symbolizing everlasting life in the midst of winter and death. The circle reminds us of God's unending love and His eternal life He makes possible. Advent can candles representing the light of Christ are often nestled in, evergreen, in the evergreen wreath. Additional decorations, like holly and berries, are sometimes added. Their red color points ahead to Jesus' sacrifice and death. Pine cones and symbolize the new life that Jesus brings through his resurrection. We join with thousands of other churches today in lighting a candle on the fourth Sunday before Christmas. The theme of this first Advent candle is prophecy. Six centuries before Christ came, the prophet Jeremiah looked ahead to the day when God would fulfill the promises that had been given to Israel. Please turn to Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16. The days are coming, declares the Lord when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. Welcome to Advent. It's great to be with you this morning to share a few minutes to look at scripture and to give ourselves a chance to kind of step into the Christmas story and see what the story has to say to us. We live a long way away from the birth of Jesus and it's good to spend some time reflecting on that. And I'm here this morning because Pastor Dan has a very bad throat infection and he can't talk, I don't think, and it's very sore, and so he uh, called me on Thursday afternoon and asked if I would speak. And of course, that's never enough time to say yes to speaking on Sunday morning, but, um, but it's been fun. Mark's been away, and it's given me some chance to uh, really sit in the story, reflect, and read scripture, and so I am not sure if I can do this justice, but um, I'm honored to have been welcomed to the pulpit again, so thank you. So, the first Sunday of Advent. You all have your candles lit at home too, I hope. What is Advent? It means the coming of Christ. And over the centuries, the church has focused on both the coming of Christ to earth as a baby, but it's also meant the anticipation of the coming of Christ again. So the, the two, Jesus' first coming 2,000 years ago and his second coming, an event that we're still waiting for, are linked together in the Advent tradition. And it's a long-standing church tradition where we, for a month, for 25 days, we reenact, we rehearse, we remember the coming of Jesus as a baby. And as we count down the days until Christmas actually gets here, we, we act. We make food, we make cookies, we gather gifts that we can share. We share our resources with others who need us to share with them. We sing carols, we, we, um, we party, we eat. And we repeat the Christmas story again and again. We, we read it, we recite it, we, 
we act it out on our church platforms and our school gyms. We sing it, we, we tell a story to each other, we, we write blessings to one another in honor of Christmas. We act as we wait for time to pass. We think about it, we ponder the story, we, we reflect on it, we rejoice, we, we question why did this happen and how did that happen? We, we marvel and we celebrate. And we do all this annually in the Advent season. We wait. But are we waiting and doing it the right way? Are we celebrating Advent in a way that's meaningful and appropriate for us as followers of Jesus? So this morning we're going to look at Luke chapter 2, at some minor characters in the Christmas story who show us briefly what it was like to wait, to actively wait. And maybe we can assess our own experience in light of theirs. So we're going to read Luke chapter 2. These characters, you know, they just show up for a couple of verses and then disappear again, and we never hear from them again. But we know their names, because this is an important section of what happened. So Luke 2, 22, verse 22, I'm reading from the ESV. And when the time came for their purification, that's like Mary and Jesus, according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice, according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the, G the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the falling and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, and she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jesus. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Interesting. Simeon and Anna, minor characters we only see in this passage, and then never hear from them again. And both of them, Luke says, are waiting. Simeon is waiting for the consolation of Israel. And Anna spoke about this baby that she saw to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. These are kind of an important phrase that just jumped out at me. It's kind of a striking phrase, waiting for the consolation of, of Israel. When a phrase is kind of rep repeated or a concept is repeated, it's important, I think, to stop and take a look at it. See, what does it mean? The consolation of Israel. Israel needed comfort and consolation. Jerusalem needed to be rescued and redeemed. So let's think about that for a second. Remember that God had made promises to Simeon and Anna's forefathers generations before. In early Genesis, God makes a promise to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, he says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And the families of Abraham repeated that promise. 
They had new clothes and they told their children. Moses also received a promise. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, Moses told the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And then a few generations later, David receives a promise, which is repeated again to Solomon. In 2 Samuel 16, it says that your house Talking to David, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And when Solomon is finished building the temple, he's promised that I will establish your throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. More promises of God for the people of Israel. And these promises are remembered and they're told to their kids and they're recited and rehearsed. Years later, Isaiah prophesies, Isaiah 9, this is, a, this is our Advent verses. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulder. And it goes on, as you know, his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. The prophecy of Jeremiah that was read to us earlier as the Ungers were lighting the candle was, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. And then if you keep fast forwarding to Micah, you have the promise of God through Micah. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. And so these promises through generations the Israel nation are repeated. Children were taught to pray for the Messiah's appearance. The promises are taught, memorized, recited from father to son, from mother to daughter, families to families, grandparents teaching grandchildren. They're memorized and they're prayed, they're chanted, sung, recited, repeated. The people of Israel were waiting in hope for God to break into history again, to console them, and to redeem him. They were waiting for the Messiah's rescue. And by the first century, by the time this is happening in Luke 2, the, there were centuries of like pent-up waiting. And there was a ton of interpretations on how people thought it was actually going to happen. So people thought, you know, maybe the Messiah would be a political leader, and a lot of those prophecies uh, hint in that way. They thought maybe Moses and Elijah would be resurrected and come back. A variety of things that people thought. But for sure, by the time that Christ is born, one question, we're told, raises above them all. Why does Messiah delay his coming? It has been years and years and years generations of waiting. And the nation of Israel is war-weary. They're frustrated with servitude. They're, they're impoverished by unreasonable taxes. They need consolation. And so the story is set in a period of strife. Israel's under foreign rule, waiting and hoping in prayerful expectation for the coming of the Messiah. Israel looks back to God's gracious past actions on their behalf, leading them out of Egypt in the Exodus, and on this basis, because he's promised and he's done it for them before, they call for God once again to act for them. Simeon and Anna, waiting in expectation. So let's just return to the story for a bit. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Remember, we're going to recite that for the next three weeks. He's born in Bethlehem, and his mother and Joseph, we know, are devout God-honoring people. So they do the normal things that people do when babies are born. We, we go to the doctor at week one and week two, week four, month three. You know, we, we have our routines when babies are born, and so did they. So when Jesus was eight days old, he was circumcised and followed the rules um, that they were to do for, for boys. 
And then on the 40th day after a baby was born, a male baby was born, then there was a, um, a purification ceremony for the mother. And so on the 40th day, Luke says, after his birth, Mary, as all Jewish mothers did, needed to go do the purification ceremony. Now they were in Bethlehem, so it was only about eight kilometers away from the temple, and so they decided to go to, the, to Jerusalem, to go right to the temple to do this. So they bring the two birds for the offerings that they need to do, and they also are going to do the firstborn son ceremony, dedicate him to the Lord. So this encounter with Simeon and Anna occurs in the very normal expected tempo of a new baby in a family. But the actions and the words of these old people that they encounter in the temple is not normal. And so it's very, very important that Luke notates this specific encounter with these people. And who is Simeon? So we are told a little bit more about Simeon in this passage. He is righteous and devout. He's God-fearing. Simeon had not given up on the Messiah. No, he had not. Many other people may have, but he had not. With his actions of regularly participating in the Jewish practices, rituals, conversations, attendance at the temple, he showed that he believed the promises. He knew that God had acted before, and he hoped that he would again. Luke doesn't say how he knows Simeon is righteous and devout, but instinctively we know that people are righteous by what they do, what they tell us they do, and what they talk about. So their actions, what we do and say, shows if we are righteous and devout. And Simeon was righteous and devout. We also know that he's waiting for the Messiah, the consolation of Israel. So he has this an attitude of anticipation of hope, of a promise that would definitely be coming. He is waiting for justice to be done for him and for his people. He's waiting for, for grace. He's waiting for reconciliation. And then Luke tells us that the Holy Spirit was on him. In fact, very interesting, the Holy Spirit had given him a very personal promise that he would not die until he had met the Messiah. So interesting. So this attitude of, of hopeful anticipation was due to this promise that he'd been given. So personal. You personally, you're going to meet the Messiah before you die. So when the Spirit of God gave Simeon the nudge, maybe you should head over to the temple now, he didn't say, well, I'll go after the football game's done or maybe after I have a nap. He went because he was in tune with the Holy Spirit. And he was taking his cues from the Holy Spirit. And when Simeon gets to the temple that day, he knows exactly who the couple is that he's supposed to be looking for. So he's waiting for Mary and Joseph and this baby when they walk in. And he immediately goes to them takes the baby from the mother, and throwing his head back, he looks up towards heaven, and he says some really amazing things. Verse 28, he blesses God. He says, now, now he's ready to die, but he's going to die in peace. Because, why peace? Because the promise made to him and to all of Israel is fulfilled now. The Messiah is here. The promise of generations is here, in his arms, baby is the promise. And he thanks God that God has prepared this answer in front of everybody. It's not a secret. It's not hidden. And this baby will be the consolation for the whole world. Not just for Israel. For the whole world. For the Gentiles and for the nation of Israel. So Simeon blesses the parents and he tells them things that we actually know come true as we read the scripture. Yes, Jesus did affect the failure and recovery of many in Israel. He was a figure misunderstood and contradicted. The pain of a sword did thrust through Mary as her firstborn son was misunderstood, hated by the Jewish leaders, arrested, crucified, and died. And people's hearts were actually revealed because of Jesus. A godly man, waiting 
for the consolation. And Anna, well, she's old too. She's at least 84 years old, widowed for many years, devout. And Luke says she spends much of her time at the temple. She's praying. So she's a prayer warrior. She's a prophetess. She hangs around with people who think like she does, a group of like-minded people who are waiting for God to rescue Jerusalem. Waiting. But not just sitting at home waiting, active in waiting. I wonder, did she know Simeon? Probably. Was Simeon's promise something he had shared with anybody else? Had he mentioned this promise to Anna before? Had they discussed how, how they imagined Simeon would have the Messiah revealed to him? I'm not, I don't know. But she's there that day in the temple. And she's close by. And I think she, she shuffles over when she hears Simeon start to pray to hear what's going on. And wow, she can't keep silent about it. Because Luke says that she also gives thanks to God. And then she spoke of the baby to everyone who was also waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon and Anna, they're kind of like the shepherds. Other than Mary and Joseph, who had known for quite a few months that the Messiah was about to arrive on earth, Simeon and Anna are the first, one of the first people to be given the knowledge that this baby, the Messiah, had arrived. The promise had been fulfilled. They were the first people to realize that Advent had occurred. And it took many, many more years for um, the story to play out, for us to learn, for them to learn and experience how the Messiah would rescue his people, how he would be a light for revelation for the Gentiles. But they were the first group of people to realize that the waiting was done. How, how cool, very cool role to have in the story of Advent. But how do we fit into this? How do we put ourselves into this story? Well, I think we're waiting too. The Church of Jesus Christ is waiting. So in the same way, the Church, during Advent, we look back upon Christ's coming in celebration, but at the same time, we're looking forward in eager anticipation to the coming of Christ's kingdom when he returns. Waiting. Waiting develops patience. And patience shows that we, as believers and followers of Jesus, are following God's plan and his timetable rather than our own. And that we've abandoned our own idea about how the world should work. Because God has the plan, and he knows when it's the right time. And we're asked to wait. Now, the authors of the New Testament are not silent about how we're to wait. Peter, 2 Peter 3 he tells us that the time is different for God because God is not slow, because he's not wanting anybody to perish. The coming of the Lord will come when God determines it. And so, Peter says, live lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for the coming of the day of the Lord, and be diligent to be found in him and at peace. Jude talks about it too. In his little tiny letter, he says, build yourself up in your holy faith, praying in the Spirit, keeping in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of the Lord, having mercy on those who doubt. And of course, Paul has lots to say about it too, but I'm going to focus on 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul is talking about the day of the Lord is coming, and so therefore, be sober. Put on the breastplate of faith and love, the helmet of the hope of salvation. Encourage one another, build one another up. And so, I think, in Advent, we need to be waiting. Waiting like Simeon and Anna. Waiting like Paul and Peter and Jude admonish us to. We need to wait with grace, living lives of grace towards others. We need to live faithfully, expending our energy focused on loving Jesus and then being powered by the Spirit of God. We need to be expectant hopeful anticipation. Expect that God will keep his promise. Confident. 
confident that he has made a promise, and as he came at the first advent, he will come again. He will keep his promise. And we need to be spirit-filled, relying on the power given to us through the Holy Spirit to act in these ways and to respond quickly when we're nudged. Jesus is coming again. I don't know if it's going to be in our lifetime, but he is coming. But this Advent, Advent of 2018, let's wait well, shall we? Revelations 22, verse 20, the last, almost the very last words of our Bible. It says, surely I am coming soon. And then we respond, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maybe this Advent we should be saying, instead of Merry Christmas, come, Lord Jesus. And today, I think I understand a little bit better that song that we sang earlier the Come Thou Long Expected Jesus song that refers so much to this part of the story. Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our sins and fears release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for Advent. Father, thank you for the reminder that as we look backwards at your birth, we should also be anticipating and hopeful for your coming again. Help us to actively wait in ways that honor you. And this morning I pray with Paul, who said, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen.